Welcome back to Approved Unto God. I'm Joshua Govitz. We're in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 22. And we left off in verse number 21 last time. We'll be picking up and, Lord willing, finishing up the chapter. Verse number 22. Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoil them. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debts. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Father, Lord, please fill me with your spirit. Help me, Lord, give me the words to say, Lord. I pray, God, that it would be concise. Uh, as I was praying earlier with you, Lord, I don't want to overcook the goose. I just want to be able to bring about understanding of what the scripture is saying. And I pray, Lord, that I would do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse number 22, rob not the poor. You know, the Bible does have a lot to say about the poor and the mistreatment of the poor, how much God dislikes that. And I'm afraid I see a lot of Christians that have no respect for the poor. Uh, they don't want to help the poor. And then and I'm talking about fundamental Christians. They seem to look down their nose at them. They don't seem to want to help them out. They send them to the world to get their help. And what good is it if all you do is exhibit love towards one another in the church body, but then yet you won't go out and love the world at all? It's You're not much any different than the Masons or the Goose Lodge or the Moose Lodge or <laughs> whatever they call those different lodges. You know, they're all about themselves. But if you're an outsider, they're not going to try to help you at all. Generally speaking, you got to be a part of the club. I, I understand that even the moose, mooses and the gooses or whatever, they go out there and they try to have charities for people and all this stuff. But the motive of that is always going to be wrong because it comes out of an unpure heart, an unconverted heart. It's works. Good works, what, to merit salvation? That's what it is. Uh, you, even the plowing of the wicked is sin, the Bible says. But Christians ought to be good to the poor. Christians ought to want to benefit the poor and bless the poor. But especially not to rob the poor. Rob not the poor because he is poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. And here Solomon is speaking of those that are afflicted in the gate, the poor man in the gate, uh, before court systems. Before court systems, they're being taken advantage of. Uh, maybe if they get an appointed lawyer, they just give them the most junks lawyer out there. You know why? Because they have no respect for the poor. And here the poor is being oppressed. Here the poor is being robbed of this, maybe even of what, of what little possession they might have. And God doesn't like what's going on here. And he says, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. So you may be bigwigs, you may have the bigwig war, uh, lawyers, and you may be able to take away what little the poor has. And that's what, you know, the, the mega rich do oftentimes. They feed off the poor. They'll take... Uh, even the even the the, the rich uh, false teacher, the rich false preacher, they will try to rob the poor and say, "Send in your money and all this," and they want to take from what little they have. And God says, "So the Lord will plead their cause." That's his, excuse me. That's what Solomon's saying. He's going to intervene. God is watching. You're not getting away with this, swindling people out of their money and spoil the soul of those that spoil them. And remember, the spoils are what's like what's taken in war. And we're all involved in a spiritual warfare. And they're taking the spoils of these poor people. And as they conquer the poor, they overthrow, the, the rich overthrows the poor. And God says, you know what, but I'm going to spoil you. 
I'm going to get all that back that you've taken. And if it's not in this life, in the life to come, God is going to be sure that justice is served. He is not going to let anything uh, or let any rock be un unturned or overturned. These crooked dealings that you've done, you rich people that oppress the poor, God says, I am going to expose you. I am an exact punishment for what you've done. None of it's gonna 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 go. Uh, I'm not gonna overlook any of it. That's what God's saying. I'm gonna spoil you. You don't want to stand before God for oppressing the poor when God says to bless the poor and He loves the poor. He became poor. You know, and they looked at Paul the apostle and they had a hard time believing he was a Roman citizen because he was so poor. They said, well, how could a Roman citizen look like that? You know, but he was becoming poor for the sake of the gospel, to get the gospel out. And God loves the poor. God is going to plead the cause of the poor. Verse number 24, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. Who you choose to have as friends is very important. And if you want to hang around a person that is an angry man, a man who loses his temper, has a short fuse, you are like who you hang around with. And it's only a matter of time before you start emulating that angry man and you start flying off at the handle. Uh, you might even think it's funny. You know, and I've hung around with the wrong kind of person or maybe even worked with the wrong kind of person and I've uh, observed their influence in my life on a negative negatively how they 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 cause me to be maybe more angry or more crude or rude in my speech and sinful in my actions and my ways because I was around them and I kept hanging around them uh, fellowshipping with them and it's so important that we choose the right kind of friends we don't want to be around people that are angry all the time especially in the church people that get angry at all the preaching or angry at one another at the body of Christ they don't discern the body they they're all about themselves and they'll sneer at you and look at you uh, in a negative fashion because you're not you're not as holy as me you're not as good as me and people are living in anger and God says don't even be friends with an angry person and with a furious man thou shall not go don't walk in his ways. Don't walk in his paths. Don't go with them. Uh, with the furious man, thou shalt not go. And I know this is kind of a silly illustration, but I'm just thinking about uh, people People living a double life, maybe even going into bars and all this and, and having friends that are furious people, angry people. And all of a sudden, you're going to find yourself in some kind of big old bar fight or bar brawl. You're going to find yourself... Uh, getting hurt. You're going to find yourself, because you keep the wrong company, uh, being destroyed along with them. And, oh, you think Christians go to bars? Well, yeah, I think a lot of them do. A lot of them that are maybe the Sunday morning glories, or maybe they show up a handful of times out of the year, and you say a saved person could do that? Yes, a saved person can do that. A saved person can fall away from that which is right and the, and the right path and can start being influenced by the outside world. If you quit going to church, you're going to start being influenced by angry men, furious men, uh, men that are liars, men that are, are stealers uh, or thieves and robbers. and The right kind of people that you need in your life are going to be found in the fellowship of the church. And if you start turning away from the church, you're going to start fellowship. You're going to continue to fellowship, but you're going to fellowship with the wrong kind of people. You're going to find yourself getting in trouble. You're going to find yourself being snared because you are following after their ways, not godly ways. God is long suffering. God is patient. But then some would say, "Well, God is angry with the wicked." Yes, He is. He's angry every day with the wicked, and God is also a, a furious. God shows fury. He will destroy those at a second coming in his fury. Uh, and there's many 
of verses of scripture that I went through, and I, and I didn't write down any references because I don't want to make this too long, where the Bible has God being described as angry and furious or showing fury. But that's God. God can be angry. God told us to be angry and sin not. God does not want us living in anger. God wants us to be loving as he is loving, but, but he doesn't really want to trust us with anger. Anger that's composed, maybe. Maybe a, a, a righteous anger. Angry at, at the devil. Angry at those that would oppose the gospel. Uh, a righteous indignation. Those that would hinder the gospel. Uh, but it, it's anger under control. God would never have us to lose our temper. It's okay to have a temper, but not to lose it. Make no friendship with the angry. So God can be angry, but God is holy. And God can show fury also. But it's no excuse for you to show fury. The Bible does not say anywhere for us to be furious. Though God is furious. He cannot trust you with wrath, though God exhibits wrath. Anger, fury, and wrath. And, and I remember Brother Doss talking about men that go into war, and after they defeated the enemy, their, their fury doesn't stop there. They start killing the animals, the beasts. They start destroying and, 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 and they get bloodlust where they just can't stop. They can't control it. And, and, and a man that's angry, a man that's furious, maybe with an adulterer, an adulterous wife, may go in there and, and intend to, 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 to end the adulterer, but then you can't stop there and you just keep killing you you maybe you you kill your uh, the adulterer that's committing adultery with your wife but then you end up killing your wife too in the midst of all that maybe your kids are standing by and all of a sudden you realize what you've done and that you realize you're going to be thrown in prison for life now your children are going to not going to have a mother they're not going to have a dad and now you kill them too this kind of stuff happens this is why God says you are not to be angry. You are not to be blinded with fury and rage and wrath. You cannot be trusted with these things. Now, when we're glorified together with him, I believe God will trust us to be fully angry and furious and, and wrathful. He will allow us to execute judgment and, and, and be placed over people in leadership positions and he will rule with a rod of iron, and I believe he will uh, delegate that also to us, that authority. But right now, he tells us to keep your temper, to keep control, not to be around those kind of people lest you learn of their ways. Verse 25, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. It's going to be a snare to your soul, to who you are, the, the inner inner man, the real you, you're going to become like this person. You're going to start, you know, like water being poured into a container. It's going to take the form of that container. And you don't want to take the form of an angry man or a furious man. You don't want to learn their ways. It's a snare to your soul, who you are. You, it's going to change who you are. You don't want to be like that. Um, because you're, because you're not perfectly righteous. You're not to be entrusted with, with it in this life. Verse number twenty-six: Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debts. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away that bed from under thee? And we have went through this before, and and it, multiple times. And I'm not going to go too long on it, but God's just saying. And, and Solomon's warning, be not thou one of them that strike hands. That's one that's going to like shake hands or sign a document. 
and and be sureties or be a cosigner for people's debts. And if you have nothing to pay, if you can't afford to pay that debt, if the person cannot pay it, they may take the bed out from underneath you and they're not going to show any mercy. They don't care. They don't care that you have nothing to pay. They'll take you for everything you have. And that's what we see here in verse 22. Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppressed, afflicted in the gate. Uh, this is the poor being afflicted and robbed and maybe having no reason to be robbed. Here, they may take it away and God might not intervene. God warns you and he says, don't be signing uh, co-signments if you don't have the money to pay. You're going to get yourself a snare. They're going to take your bed from out from underneath you. And God says, use wisdom. If you have the money and you, and you could take the hit, then go ahead and sign it. Realizing that this may this is possible, this could happen. But if you don't have nothing, I wouldn't necessarily expect the Lord to intervene. So you got to be careful. Verse number twenty-eight: Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. The fathers have set landmarks, borders that you are to keep within your borders. Um, when you have a land agreement, they set up borders. And here, the fathers have set up these borders, and oftentimes the, ch the children inherit, the, 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 the sons would inherit the, the land from their father. And the phone call going on here. Brother Matt. <laughs> Brother Matt. Oh, it's something, but how easy it is to be distracted from what you're trying to do here. Uh, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. So if you get land inheritances, don't try to stretch that and say, oh, really, the border goes out here into your land. This is taking advantage. People do this. People, people, if they see that maybe it's a barren land that, that the neighbors have, that nobody's there, they may try to try to stretch their borders and all of a sudden start taking down some of those uh, that rough land and making it theirs and, 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 and expanding their borders and all of a sudden you come to your land and maybe you haven't been there for years and all of a sudden the neighbors are taking uh, expanding their borders taking the liberty to expand their borders and that's not their land and then they may enter into court battles and all this stuff but the problem with lust, the problem with uh, covetousness is that you would try to take what's not yours and we see nations that try to overtake other nations poor nations destroy them uh, expand their borders and we see Russia um, that re Ukraine used to be a part of Russia but they have their own sovereignty their own nation and now they want to try to overthrow those borders and take that nation and you think it's going to stop there? No, it's going to continue. They'll go further and further. And I believe that's going to lead up to trying to take over Israel. But it's it's greed. It's the greed that's in the heart of, uh, of unconverted man. And sometimes even in the heart of, of a man that is converted. God warns you not to be covetous. He warns you and he tells you to be content with the things that you have. Uh, discontentment would cause you to try to take land from others, try to take uh, the money from others. Uh, you think, oh, I, I, I have right to that. You feel like you're entitled, but you're not entitled. What you have is what you have. That, that border markings is going to show this is what you have. This is your land. And you have no right to, to take other people's land. You have no right to take another man's beast or, or, or oxen or ass or whatever. God said, don't covet that. Or another man's wife. Well, he mistreats her. So what, you're going to feel like you're entitled to have her to yourself because you're going to treat her good, are you? Okay. But, but people, they, they remove the borders. They remove the ancient landmarks and they find themselves in trouble. Look at 2310, uh, Proverbs 2310. Remove not 
the old landmark and, in, and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. So here we also see trying to take advantage of the fatherless. You have a father. You're not an orphan. You've inherited a land. And now you're trying to take it away and expand your borders unlawfully to take the land from, from uh, the fatherless. And I have a little cross-reference back over 22 and 23 of, of chapter 22. Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppressed afflicted in the gate. And you, it, might, it might end up in court. You're trying to take the land from, from the poor and from the fatherless. And then you take them in the gate or, or to court and you know because you're a big wig you got a lot of money you got the, you can hire the biggest lawyers and you're going to take that land for yourself but the Lord is going to end up pleading their cause and to spoil the soul of those that spoiled them he'll spoil the soul of those excuse me that spoil them you may win in the courts you may expand your borders you may take their land but God says I'm going to get it back I'm going to spoil you. This is not overlooked by God. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers has set. So this is a warning against covetousness. Uh, in verse 11 in chapter 23, For their Redeemer is mighty. You know, you're taking land from those that aren't mighty, those that can't really defend themselves, but their Redeemer is mighty. He shall plead their cause with thee. God's going to deal with you. I think God's going to deal with your heart. God is going to deal with your conscience concerning this. And uh, you're going against God when, when you afflict the poor, when you uh, think you're entitled to their land and their property or their wife or their anything that's theirs. It's not yours. It's theirs. And, and God is warning against that here in verse 28. And we can go into removing the ancient landmark and, and really expanding our borders and trying to be more like the world and go out into the world, but in a wrong sense, loving the world. And, you know, the world moves this way. Like, the, I've seen the illustration of the bathing suits. How they used to be more like suits, you know, and uh, and then all of a sudden they became really, uh, you know, the one-piece bathing suit, and where they used to be sort of like shorts that women would wear, and all of a sudden now it's a one-piece and it shows a lot more of the thigh and all this, and then it becomes two-piece, and then they're, you know, wearing string bikinis and all this stuff, but oh, the world goes further with that, so then the Christian woman will move up forward and, and, and oh I'm just wearing a one piece yeah but that was really <laughs> pushing the envelope 50 60 years ago and now you're the, the, the world moves over here and you feel like you're okay and justified wearing this because oh well, I'm not wearing the two piece or I'm not wearing the string bikini or a thong and it's a slippery slope I mean and that's just one example but there's you know many examples I'm not going to go into it like I said I don't want to overcook the goose but I want you to understand that people do that all the time they they uh, they start loosening up their standards they try to expand uh, what they can get away with and and God says don't do that stick to the old path stick to the old ways uh, even even in our Bible preaching and teaching we ought not to use other versions of the Bible don't don't expand like as if you're going to expand your knowledge because you're using a different version or some sort of uh, um, paraphrasing or or I or I need to go to the Greek or I needed to go to the Hebrew you don't this is the border of this Bible is all you need you don't need to go to some sort of lexicon or man, different uh, older manuscripts. Oh, I go back to the originals. I hear people talk about in their studies. I go to the originals, but you've never seen the originals. There are no originals. Um, there's a lot of different things. You know, the, the the church can start mimicking the world. The the church can start taking on the characteristics of the world. You know why they removed the ancient landmarks? This would have never. 50 years ago this would have never flew but but now Christians 
are looking more and more like the world. Preachers are looking more and more like the world. They remove the ancient landmarks. And they compare themselves to the false teacher, to the false preachers. They may even have ministries exposing these false preachers and teachers. And they compare themselves to these obvious false teachers and they, 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 they don't realize how far gone they are. How worldly they are. Because well, I'm not as worldly as Bethel or, or Hillsong or whatever. Or I'm not as worldly as uh, some of these mega church preachers and I don't wear skinny jeans when I'm up there on the pulpit or whatever. But you comparing yourselves amongst yourselves is not wise, the Bible says. You need to stick to the old paths. You don't need to compare yourself to somebody else and say, well, I'm not as unholy as him, or I'm not as worldly as this preacher or this congregation. You're wrong in doing that. Seest thou a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings, he shall not stand before mean men. And God is a rewarder of a diligent heart, a man who is diligent in his business. And that can go for a worldly business. Uh, if you're going to be a diligent, hard worker, you can expect to have raises. You can expect, I wouldn't ask for them, but, but expect that you will move up the ladder. Because people are looking for that. There's a bunch of slackers. There's plenty of those. They're a dime a dozen. But bosses, uh, businessmen, they look for a man that is diligent in his business. And uh, they're the ones that will, will, will rise up the ladder. He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. But also, a man that's diligent in, in, the, in the Lord's business will also move up. God is the, uh, the promoter. He, the promotion cometh not from the east or the west or from the south, but it comes from the north, comes from God. He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. And I think of the Apostle Paul. He preached the gospel, and he was diligent to do so. And those in Asia said, man, he's been throughout all Asia causing a stir and preaching the gospel, and he turned the world upside down. And he, he was famous everywhere he went, famous for though he's persecuted, he will not stop. Though they beat him with rods, he will not stop. Though they threaten his life, though they fast, saying, we're going to kill this man. And we'll stop at nothing but until we until we kill him. We're going to tear him apart. We're going to destroy this man because of what he does. And he, nothing will sway him from being diligent. Nothing will cause him to stop the service of the Lord out of fear of man. And you know what happened? A, a, a group of Jews saw him going into a temple with some Gentiles. And because he brought... Gentiles in there, I, I believe, or I think he might have been in there by himself. I'd have to look at it again. But they were accusing him of, of having Gentiles going into the, the temple. And they were capturing him, ready to destroy him. And then he stood before governors. And he stood before men that were governors uh, that, that would, would plead his cause, that would listen to him, men of wisdom. These men, these Jews just want to destroy him out of passion, out of fury, out of anger. They're just set out against him to destroy Paul and his ministry and his life. But God sees to it that he is able to plead his cause and what he's doing, his work, his ministry, to governors and Claudius uh, Lystra, if I'm saying that right, he uh, writes a letter to, to Felix, a governor, and he says, I'm going to send him over to you. And then he goes to Festus, or vice versa, and then he goes to King Agrippa, and then he goes to, to appeal to Caesar. But all the while, there's Jews there that want to destroy him, and the Bible says that they would have tore him apart. But these men intervene. These men, he stands before kings. He stands before governors. And he's able to be a witness to these men. 
almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, King Agrippa said. And I believe Felix said, well, I'll listen to thee at a more convenient time. But God caused uh, a diligent man, the Apostle Paul, to even stand before kings and be a witness. And he, and he prophesied of that. God told him, I'm going to have you, your ministry, to the Gentiles, and I'm going to have you stand before kings. I'm going to have you preach the gospel to, to, the, to the greatest leaders uh, of, the whole, of the whole realm that he's in. And it's an amazing thing to see the reward that God does for a man that's diligent in his business. And oftentimes, God will put you, if, if he sees you're diligent in a little thing, he will, he will give you a bigger thing. Sometimes, maybe not in this life. Uh, I heard Bro Brother Knox say that everything that we do, all ministry, though we might think some ministries are big and some are small, in this life it's all small. This is all the little stuff. The big stuff is yet to come. The big stuff is yet to come in the millennial reign. But will you be diligent in business? Will you be faithful? God might give you an audience uh, with very, very prominent people to get the gospel to them because you're diligent. He says, you know what? I can trust him. And and when that millennial reign comes, God says, I'll, I'll let you rule. I'll let you reign. And uh, God is going to reward the diligent. And you say, well, I'm not getting any reward now, but it's not about your best life now. Live your life for God. Put God first. Be diligent to read your Bible. Be diligent to pray. Be diligent to uh, bless one another. To be ready to give to those that are in need. Bless the oppressed and the poor. Uh, have a heart, a giving heart. A bountiful eye, not a covetous heart, a covetous eye. Desire to bless somebody, not take their land, not take away what you think you're entitled to because God will oppress you. Be diligent in your business. Be diligent to observe to do what the Word of God says. Take the Word in not just as a hearer but as a doer. Say, Lord, help me to understand what the Bible's saying and help me not just to give intellectual assent to what it's saying, but to practice it in my life. And God says, you know what? That's the kind of man I want you to be. Not an angry man, not a furious man, not a covetous man. I want you to be a diligent man and you'll stand before kings and you'll stand before the king of kings one day. And don't you want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? When he reads your report of what you've done in this life, don't you want it to be glory to him? You weren't self-glorying. You weren't glorying in your own, your own thing. But you were all about his business. This has been Approved Unto God. And I hope you join me again next time. Amen.